Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We are still seeing a few more people joining the webinar, so let's give them a couple of minutes and we should get started shortly. Hello and welcome once again to today's webinar on maximizing customer value in banking using predictive behavioral analytics. My name is Saloni and I'd be your host for today's webinar. So before we get started, I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping notes so you know how to participate in today's session. You have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will be collecting these and answering them at the end of the presentations. We will also be sharing the email IDs of both the speakers at the end of our presentation if you want to reach out to them for any specifics. So without further delay, let us get started. Today, what we will cover is an introduction of the panelists, followed by a brief overview of Maverick Systems and exemplify consulting. We will then delve into behavioral analytics and what makes it real. We will conclude and then move on to the Q&A. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Our first panelist for today's webinar is Peter Dorrington, who is the founder of Exemplify Consulting. Peter is an expert in using a combination of data and behavioral sciences to lead transformation in the field of experience management within omni-channel environments. His main, main focus area is uh, predicting customer behavior and quantifying the business impact to the same. Our second panelist for today is Murli Tharpai, who is an executive director at Maverick Systems. Murli, with an experience of 25 years, is a hands-on technologist and has been credited with building and transforming cutting-edge scalable IT products and platforms for finance and retail leaders like Tesco and Altisource across US, UK, and India. I would now pass it on to Murli to take it forward. Thanks, uh, thanks, Saloni. Uh, uh, thanks, friends, uh, for uh, joining and uh, uh, listening to us. Uh, let me start off uh, by uh, introducing Maverick Systems. Uh, we do believe that every customer uh, journey is uh, unique and uh, uh, we have been part of uh, the banking journey with uh, their customers. We started off uh, as helping banks to ensure that whatever they were computerizing 20 years ago was fit for use. That was the need of the art. We chipped in, we did a lot of validation. Then, you know, bespoke development gave way to uh, banks uh, starting to adopt uh, uh, adopt uh, core banking systems, and we developed expertise there. Uh, automation was need of the hour. We went into that, and then entire things have started changing around five years ago, where business or our banking was moving to the internet, or our multi-channel banking was being demanded, and we evolved along with that. We realized that at times core banking systems tend to uh, put you in a slower trajectory. So we worked very closely with uh, Terminos to ensure that uh, T24 can get connected. And we have uh, been working with a lot of transformation projects uh, to get ready for digital. Then when you're talking about experiencing, uh, experience uh, engineering, as we call it, which is to ensure that uh, all your customers are engaged appropriately, using appropriate channels, and also you can engage with your extended ecosystems through open banking. We have some solutions there. 
uh, today's idea is not to get delve in deeper into that uh, maybe some other time uh, and and then we do believe that everything in banks is about data and there we have uh, a lot of products but uh, as we are discussing today is uh, more about doing predictive analytics of various things out of that like we said every customer journey is unique and every customer's behavior we need to understand and that is where we said we need to bring in appropriate partners uh, not only data and engineering and that is where we have uh, teamed up with uh, exemplify uh, who uh, peter uh, started this he will introduce that but you know uh, bring in the experts and engineering and digital together so that you can benefit by understanding customers behavior by providing hyper personalized solutions i'll, I'll spend a short time trying to uh, explain how we are organized uh, in our data tech to provide various solutions uh, and and how it links to uh, providing you know predictive uh, behavior analytics and how linking it back to various places so uh, first of all we we have five services which uh, helps you uh, among other things you know in in banking also to do behavior analytics that is there are pipelines which i'll come back and talk about after uh, peter has uh, explained to us what behavior analytics is all about uh, to build the data pipelines or it can also be data lakes if you don't have one which is uh, where we'll pick up various streams of data to understand the customer then you will require advanced analytics to ensure to understand you know uh, the behavior analytics is all about nlp and you know uh, getting the machines to come back and uh, uh, look at various angles of it and then come back and tell us using visual analytics uh, how and what and why you need to take certain decisions and all of this need to happen within the uh, appropriate data governance and rules of uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, geography so we do have uh, expertise and depth in data governance which will ensure that you are complying to gdpr you are complying to various other requirements which are needed we also have some solutions like data for digital or data migration by the way, this uh, particular, if you are doing predictive uh, behavioral analytics through us, and at some point of time, we would uh, have a trunk wrap product, but less likely in the next two, three years, it will be you know, more. Each bank will have uh, their own uh, competency and maturity around how to use behavioral analytics. Now, to do that, you know, it is, it's not uh, me and Peter alone trying to do that. You need to have a lot of building blocks uh, which ensures whether it is a, a large scale uh, ETL of uh, managing the data pipeline. So we have uh, uh, been uh, partnering with old and the new. For example, Abinisho is there in most of the large banks uh, helping to do their ETL. Uh, Metillion and Talent are, are pioneers or innovators who are disrupting uh, by uh, providing open source -ish and uh, easily integrable platform and products. Same thing in terms of analytics. While we do some of our own uh, analytics using open source Python and R, but we also are uh, very well versed with using you know Adobe or Glassbox to understand uh, what uh, a customer is doing with our multi-channel platforms. We also have uh, big data uh, partnerships where we can either on the cloud or uh, in premise, we can help you to build the required compute and storage to ensure because uh, capturing all emotions will mean that all interactions with the customer need to be stored, need to be reviewed, need to be analyzed and need to be processed. So with that, I will let uh, uh, Peter to take walk us through uh, what will be an enriching experience uh, for uh, all of us and uh, introducing Exemplify Computing. Thanks. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Marley. So um, I'm only going to spend a second or two on this. Uh, Exemplify Consulting was set up at the beginning of this year to help organizations like yours excel in experience management. That's where the XM comes from. 
Now, experience management is where customer experience, employee experience, and business-to-business -business partner experience meet. And the reason I focus on this is not to look at how journeys take place and optimize those, but really the business results. So how can experience management contribute to business outcomes that we all are interested in? And my business model is to help organizations do this for themselves rather than me doing it to them or for them. So I'm going to spend some time today talking about a new kind of analytics. It came out of thinking about customers and thinking differently about customers, um, but it's predictive behavioral analytics. And that's quite a mouthful. And before I go on, I just want to take a moment to give you some definitions. So let's start with the word behavior. Now, for data scientists, this often means something very specific. It means the things that they can measure and observe from which they can draw inferences about uh, what effect that those things are having. So a decision model may be based on several different factors that can predict an outcome. But it very much is looking at the effect of human behavior. But in the world where I've been working for the last four years, behavior is more about motivation. And why do people do what they do, i.e. what causes the things that we can measure through the effect? So that's the first distinction. When I talk about behavior, I'm not talking about measuring or observations or data, which is after the fact. I'm looking at motivations, which are before. Now, of course, I combine the two. And that leads me to the second definition, which is predictive. So many of you will be using predictive analytics techniques already. You'll be using data mining, machine learning. You'll be encapsulating those in things like um, artificial intelligence to help optimize, automate, and run your businesses. And I would take nothing away from that. But our unique approach has given us a breakthrough in a different area. Rather than wait until we see symptoms, we're looking at the root causes. And that gives us an opportunity to be very predictive and proactive. So we don't wait until somebody displays a symptom that we have learned is associated with an effect. We actually look at saying, is the cause in place? And if it is, we can predict that they will become symptomatic, to take that analogy to its ultimate extent. So that's the two ways that I'd like to define this. It's behavior in terms of motivation, and it's in predictive in that we can predict what people are likely to do if they're stimulated or motivated in a particular way. So how does the model work? Well, um, there's lots of ways that we could model human behavior, um, and I'm based mine very soundly on uh, behavioral economics and things like neuroscience. So all behavior starts with a stimulus and has a decision between the stimulus and the action. So let's look at the, how we might evaluate that. The first thing on the right is to say, the rational needs. These are the things we consciously think about. So they're things like price, availability, convenience. Does it actually do what I need? And these are front of mind when we're making a decision and they're very important. But what the neuroscience has shown us is that at least as important is how we feel about a decision and our emotional wants. Now, most wants are about a future state. I want to feel happier. I want to feel less afraid or I want to feel more confident about the future. So that's the first dimension, a balance between what I need and what I want. And interestingly, the neuroscience shows that often what I want is decided far quicker than what I need. And sometimes that rational side rationalizes what I've decided emotionally I want. But that's not operating in a vacuum. So. When we're confused about the decision, we're not quite sure what to do or we think it's complex, we often look around us and this is where external influence comes to play. So the wisdom of crowds. So we tend to be herd animals and if we're unsure, we'll go with the herd. What did the herd do? And this is why star ratings are so important because we use those as an external validation that a decision is gonna be the right one. It's got a lot of likes, it must be good. So there's that external influence. But then there's the way that we actually behave, and there are two internal biases that we need to deal with. The first of which is a cognitive bias. This is where, when we're thinking through a problem, we think we're being logical and rational, but really we're not. Often we're fooling ourselves or we're making a logic mistake. And we know there's about 150 of these 
that influence the decisions we make. And if you've ever left home and come back with two of something you never intended to buy one of in the first place, it was probably because of a cognitive bias about your perception of value. There's another internal bias, which is unconscious bias. And these are stereotypes, extrapolations, prejudices. And we don't even think about these. Um, they're unconscious, that they're, they're just there influencing subtly our decisions. So we need to take those into account as well. And then finally, there's the stimulus in the context. What is it that I'm actually trying to do right now and how? Um, because that will often affect the decision that we make. If something is more urgent, it will get a higher precedence than if it's not. But the really big one, and the one that we had to work really hard to solve, was the influence of our personal history. How did I get to today? Because our experiences set expectations, and it's against expectations that we evaluate whether an experience is good or not. So it's okay to have a budget experience if that's what you expected and that's what you paid for. It's not okay if you're expecting a premier experience and you get a budget experience. So those are the six factors that we built into the model. And this is how we can understand what's important to people and how they use that to help make a decision which informs the actions that ultimately we can observe. So it's predictive. When we use these models, we can get a probability about what the person will do next if they're faced with a particular circumstance. We can extrapolate an individual conversation or an interaction or an episode to a customer lifetime from when they first join an organization to when they ultimately may leave. And not only that, we can extrapolate it from a small group of individuals to an entire customer database because the things that we find important for one group are probably important to others. And if we measure the importance of the events, we can extrapolate those impacts. Finally, we can do that on a very frequent basis. Ultimately, you could do it in near real time if that's what you wanted to do. It's probably enough for most people to look at doing something like a weekly or an emotional state. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like in a moment. So six factors. There's emotional, there's rational, there's the influence of others and the way that we think about things as well, as well as our own personal histories. And Morley mentioned this, all of our individual journeys are just that, they're individual, they're unique to us. So how does this work? Well, imagine that this is actually just a series of numbers for every customer that's changing in the computer system. But look to the right hand side and here's one representation of how an emotion, a big influencer in decisions, can be represented. So on the horizontal axis, we have valence. On the right-hand side, positive valence, which means that it's pleasant. And on the left-hand side, negative valence, which means that we find it unpleasant. Um, abstract, of course, because we may say that fear is a unpleasant negative emotion, but it's very good for survival. So it actually has a positive effect on our life. The other axis is the vertical one, and it's the level of energy or arousal that we feel around each of those emotions. So at the bottom, we have low arousal, low energy, and if you're tired or calm or even deeply depressed, you don't have energy to do things, you'll be at the bottom of that diagram. However, if you're highly energized, if you're enraged or excited or ecstatic about happiness, then you'll have a high level of arousal. So look at these different emotions and where they feel. For every single one of us, each of these emotions is changing minute to minute, hour to hour, day by day. And let's look at the one on the top left, which is anger. So we can see how anger evolves from being perhaps annoyed, which is slightly negative and has a reasonable level of um, uh, energy associated arousal, through to anger, more negative, more energy, to enraged, very negative, very in, um, aroused. So each of these moves independently um, by the things that stimulate them. So that's how we could represent them. And they say they change on a frequent basis and they're different for every customer, particularly because they start in different places. But why is this important? Well, I've done a lot of research in this field and I've looked at a lot of data and it's real customer data. So the first thing I found was that by understanding through the language that people use, um, we could detect and categorize what they were feeling. And we could do that from the Bartons, but without asking them a direct question. So if you want to know how somebody feels, the worst thing you could do is ask them, how 
do you feel? Most of us struggle to answer that in an honest way, particularly because we're trying to give a rational cognitive answer to something which is subconscious and emotional. What we also saw very clearly in the data is that emotions as part of the decision-making set are absolutely linked to business outcomes. They affect decisions that we make every single day. In fact, their influence on decisions about money is over-indexed because we don't really know what to make of money. It's an abstraction and we didn't evolve from, with money until the last couple of thousand years. But absolutely, you can link emotional states to the decisions that people make. And that's intuitive, right? So if a customer's really angry and upset and disappointed by us, they're much more likely to close an account or to move their business elsewhere. It also does affect, though, in the long term, things like the customer lifetime value. So not only do we want to increase their tenure, we want to increase their economic activity during that tenure. Anybody can be a customer for 40 years and not do anything. We need customers who are going to be customers for 40 years and are active. What I did find, which was initially surprising though, was that the ways I did the research on how I found those narratives showed that there was very little difference between doing things like um, surveys or panels or interacting with people or even indirect observation. They all gave broadly similar results. More importantly, they give broadly similar results across different groups. So the same kinds of things that irritate one group typically irritate another group. And when we come to data mining, and when we build these emotional indexes into models, what we found was that emotions um, were more predictive than sentiment. So a lot of us have done sentiment analysis or an understanding of text. In fact, that they were only second to the kinds of data that, that we already hold about a customer. So things like how much do they have on deposit? When did they last visit us? When was our last engagement? And so on. So they have incredible predictive strength. And when we add those to the predictive models, we make them both more accurate and better able to discriminate between different groups. So let's look at what the outcomes of those might be. Well, let's look firstly at revenues. And what we found was that if you're looking at things like sales or marketing campaigns um, or just operational benefits, that we could increase revenue anywhere between 10 and 30 percent. Similarly, when we were looking at cross-sell and upsell campaigns, we could increase product holdings by a broadly similar kind of amount. However, costs were dramatically reduced. So by using these techniques, and I'll give you an example in a moment, to reduce our costs and to um, affect things like marketing, then savings are much larger. Anything between 30 and 60% is easily achievable on a campaign basis. And finally, we could reduce churn by between five and 15%. Now, of course, these can't be achieved at the same time. So achieving um, a lot of customer retention is sometimes at the cost of making an immediate revenue hit. So we balance these factors through. And of course, it depends upon the actions that we take on the insights that we're given. Nonetheless, there is a lot of money on the table that can be gathered if we take this kind of approach forward. And let me give you a couple of case studies to illustrate that. So the first one is I'm going to talk about somebody called Sam. So Sam has been a customer of a bank for some time. Um, he's just the visitor's way of paying in his salary, paying his bills, and he does have a, a deposit account into which he makes the occasional deposit. Now, recently, Sam has been worried by what's going on in the world of COVID-19, um, and he's concerned. However, the bank thinks that Sam is a good customer, and they would like to keep him, and they would also like to be able to get Sam onto a product they think is better suited to his needs. So by using predictive behavioral analytics, they're able to identify that Sam is in this concerned group of existing customers who, if they could um, pitch a proposition to him in the right way with the right language, may be able to get him onto a better product. So they use the emotional state as a guide and target him with a promotion or an online savings product where he can um, set a goal and make regular deposits towards that end. And the goal for Sam in this particular case would have been build a buffer, build myself a reserve, a cash reserve for if time gets hard. Now, the initial offer intrigues Sam. You know, it is much closer to what he was thinking about. Um, and you know, he thinks, OK, that might be interesting, but he doesn't initially respond. So through non-response, the bank triggers a second campaign. And this time Sam does respond. And because this is a product that's linked to what he wants out of life, which is more security, less anxiety, 
Um, we help onboard him, we help him set a savings goal, and we help him set up an instrument to make a regular payment plan into that deposit account with the goal of achieving a level of financial security within a year, and then he can set another goal. So what does that look like? So let's have a look at this diagram. Now, there's a lot going on here, and I've tried to simplify it down to three core emotions. We've got fear, um, anxiety, which is up at the top left, fairly high level because Sam is worried. We've got surprise, very low energy, and it doesn't actually have a positive or negative impact. And in fact, usually it just multiplies the effect of other things. And then we've got some joy, and it's a little bit low than we would like because it's linked to the anxiety. So Sam is not a particularly happy customer, feels a bit taken for granted, and is worried. So that's the week one step. And nothing happens until week three. And then we make our initial offer to Sam uh, with a savings product which is very focused to his emotional needs as well as his ability to pay and save. Now he's a little bit intrigued but doesn't initially respond. But we can see that what's happened is there's a bit of surprise crept into the picture and the happiness is still there. So nothing happens for a week. And then on the second week, we make another offer, slightly perhaps different language, just to highlight some of the benefits. And this time, Sam's anxiety has come down a little bit. He's still quite surprised that the bank seems to be reading his needs quite well um, and is quite happy. And so he does respond. So he accepts the offer. Anxiety continues to drop. Surprise comes down. Um, and then we help him on board and we help him set up his goal. And we help him set up the direct debits and the transfers into his account so that we can go through. And at this point, Sam's onboarded, he's got a new product that he's using to save, and several weeks pass. So we're going through, his emotional state's changing, his surprise is going down, so now I'm not so surprised, I've got the account there, happiness begins to fall away, until Sam gets his first update, progress against his savings goal. So again, the bank's able to remind him, you're doing a great job, you're on target, look how much your savings have grown, um, you're easily going to achieve your goal within the next period. And so uh, we'll just end that on the 13th week. Um, at this point, Sam's initially high level of surprise has kind of settled down, his anxiety is much lower than it was before, and his level of happiness has increased. So Sam is in a much better state than he was before. However, None of his characteristics about how much he earns and how much he would typically uh, spend on coffee has changed in this. So this is where the blend of his emotional state and the observations that we can get from things like um, his data allow us to build a more holistic picture. But let's take another case. How we could reduce marketing spend, and I'm gonna talk about Harper very quickly here. So Harper has been a customer for a while. Um, she's happy with the bank, they're doing a good enough job, um, she just uses it as a way of paying the bills, getting things taken care of with her money. Um, but she's getting busy getting on with her life, doesn't really think about the bank very much, and she's living a very active lifestyle. The bank identifies that Harper is a customer that they would like to put onto a um, credit card product. So um, how do they cut through the noise? Harper's busy, she's not particularly going to be listening to this well. The first things to do is to identify those customers that even though they may have all the attributes of an ideal customer, are more receptive than others. So we're going to partition the same segment into two groups. Those that are going to be receptive, those that aren't. And we think Harper is one of the receptive ones. What happens to the unreceptive ones? Well, the first thing what we do is we um, actually suppress them from this campaign. Because if we market to somebody who's unreceptive, all we're going to do is irritate them. So we need to actually change the message for them. They're not ready to buy anything from us just yet. So there's the first saving. We're not going to market to a whole bunch of people who aren't ready to hear from us yet. We are going to focus though on those that are. And because we can look at the way in which we've segmented people on an emotional and behavioral level, as well as some of their um, attribute level, we can make a much more tailored offer, which means it's going to have a higher yield. So even though we market to a smaller group, more of them will respond. Harper, in this case, would be delighted. She sees something that enables her lifestyle, that anticipates some of the things that she wants. She's going to be one of the responder groups. So it's cost us less to market to a smaller group. We've got a higher yield from that smaller group. And now we've got a population that we've not interrupted with an unwanted marketing message, but whom we could include in another campaign 
to heal our relationship and get them ready for the next opportunity when they may be receptive to an offer. So reduced marketing spend, yet increased yield. And the final case I'm going to use, although there are lots of these use cases, is how to decrease customer. I'm going to talk very briefly about Noel. So Noel is a customer that's been a customer for a long time, but he definitely feels taken for granted. As far as he's concerned, all banks are the same. Um, they don't really care about him. And he thinks that banks reserve their best offers for new customers and that loyal customers like him are not particularly valued by the bank. Now, he's not yet ready to change bank. He's not actively looking to switch. However, he's in a risk group. And if somebody came along with the right message, they could appeal to Noel and stimulate him to take that action. So we want to head this off before he gets to that stage. So what the bank does is use existing churn models based upon things like economic activity, along with behavioral models. To say, is Noel in this group who behaviorally are not so well disposed towards us and may be open to a competitive message, even if they're not showing symptoms at this point? If we conclude that Noel is, and if we conclude that we would like to keep Noel's business, we can take a proactive campaign and reach out to him to show him how much we value his business. So out of the blue, Noel gets a message from the bank thanking him for his loyalty and offering him a reward that's only available to loyal customers. Now, Noel's going to be surprised by this. He thought the bank was taking him for granted. So to get this kind of message at this point is definitely going to have an impact on the way he thinks and feels about the bank. And it may take several messages to get him into a healthy state of mind about the bank but we can get him there. And when we do, what we've done is built an emotional resistance to competition. Because at the end of this process, Noel continues to feel that he is being rewarded for being a loyal customer, that he is getting added value out of this account he wasn't getting before, um, and that he's unlikely to get a similar kind of relationship with any new bank. So unless we're completely doing something wrong on the value proposition for him, financially, Noel has no incentive to change. In fact, he has an incentive to stay because he's now feeling part of being in a relationship with his bank of mutual respect and value. So there's three use cases, um, how we can increase marketing yield, how we can decrease marketing spend, and how we can influence things like customer churn. There are many other use cases, and there are many other cases we can look at purely operational aspects of banking and see how Behavior can both influence the decisions we make and how we could influence others. And at this point, I'll hand back to Murali to talk about implementation. Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, thanks a lot, uh, friends. I'm sure you know many of you would be able to relate uh, whether it is to support Sam and uh, help them on on a customized offering, or whether it is to ensure that uh, uh, people like Harper or any of your customers will get included only in campaigns which make sense to them uh, emotionally uh, and, and uh, their behavior is, is uh, to be understood and uh, whether it is to pre prevent uh, Noel from uh, taking business uh, elsewhere, we continue to value uh, him as a customer and we need to retain him. Uh, there may be many more use cases you can think about and uh, uh, while it is, uh, one a few common threads which you i'm sure would have picked up you know it all depends on how keenly you listen to your customers it is not only adequate to reach out to your customers through digital channels um, many uh, surveys have shown uh, banks or any marketer tends to overspend on what we are pushing to the customer and tend to invest lower in terms of what we are getting from them. You know, that, that's a first change, which uh, we will uh, uh, suggest that you start on. So we will, what we'll start off in this is to uh, first do a workshop, which I'll put it as phase zero, uh, where uh, we will uh, work, sit with you and uh, understand how ready you are. That is, you know, while it is uh, great to, uh, Get, uh, get get to spot a SAM and uh, being able to uh, direct a campaign which he or she cannot resist, 
but it takes some doing. So, you know, we need to understand that all data which is required for analysis is captured. It is captured, it is categorized, and it is made available for, uh, uh, for us to uh, analyze. And also you have, once the decision which uh, the engine or the platform we will build over a period of uh, 24 to, you know, uh, or, or uh, 36 to uh, 48 weeks, um, uh, you need not wait for the entire part. I'll come back to that. But uh, even before that, how ready are you? You know, what are the things which are available? Because, you know, some of those things also need to run parallelly to this. For example, once I get the campaign, do I have the wherewithal to, um, to uh, provide it and uh, in, in multiple channels. So that's that is a sitting uh, or, or a couple of sittings and where we will come back with a roadmap. And uh, typically three phases uh, is, is what uh, we will suggest to our, our, our customers, which is a pilot phase where we identify one or two use cases uh, initially. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, uh, we are we are picking up something which is extremely uh, valuable and can deliver results. So there is some some time uh, which will be taken. We will consider various use cases and pick up some which are which are low hanging, if if I can call that, and uh, build uh, 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 an, a, a score or, or build the models uh, using the data which is available already, or maybe in some cases we might have to do. Uh, supplement that with uh, some surveys and you know uh, connecting to the customers uh, we will not get into the details of that now but that those are the ones which will come in the pilot and we will generate the model and uh, uh, responsive action and we'll show it or we will demonstrate that this indeed works and also we'll collaborate and then there might be some places where we can do better when we are actually implementing and that is typically concluded in around six to nine weeks in some cases it may be more because you are already traveling in that path you would have captured those kind of uh, information you might have some efforts which are already happening so then we, it is more about you know uh, lending our expertise to <clears throat> deepen or broaden the uh, the activities uh, then thereafter it would have given us enough to build you know uh, there might be you know we might have picked up data uh, uh, in, in bits and pieces but uh, when you're building a platform it cannot be so build a pipeline of data where we have uh, a lot of experience in doing large volumes of data being stitched together to uh, uh, create a common goal so we will will have that, and then you know, in in the pipeline itself, we will be analyzing data either you know uh, periodically or you know, at an appropriate frequency, and those scores are available, not available not within the platform, but available easy to use in any of uh, campaign management, whether it's campaign management tools, whether they are digital channel management or channel data management tools or any of them we will ensure that that is available as uh, as a navigating vector for you to uh, uh, build upon uh, and, and uh, this will be uh, mostly automated and uh, the architecture is such that you can keep on adding newer models newer use cases without intruding on the others so after the build pipeline which may be anywhere from 16 to you know uh, 30 uh, 30 weeks uh, uh, you will have uh, almost all of uh, the data which is needed you know available in one pl one place in a, a very useful manner and most importantly you will be listening very keenly to your customers through all your channels once that is achieved we already would have during the phase two or, or the step two itself, we would have understood and we would have built at least three or four nudges which are possible or, or you know, we can tell what the persona is. I'll, I'll come back to the architecture of a little bit of that. And uh, you would have had that, but this will stitch the things in, whether it is incorporating into your workflow or, or automated data ingestion into digital and even the digital platforms will start showing next best whatever uh, which is needed. But this provides that intellect uh, which is getting stimulated from what you are listening and then analyzing and understanding their uh, behavior and, and uh, 
predicting what they will do next provided you give an appropriate niche and by this time you would have and that uh, will come with a governance you know uh, design of experiments whichever way you are going to roll it out and that should conclude our our initial uh, interactions uh, and we would have crossed a lot of boxes but by that time you would have understood what it takes to add models uh, and uh, what it takes to uh, uh, stitch it all together and uh, uh, expertise would have deepened uh, we can continue to on that journey in a managed services mode but at the same time you would have realized that each step whether it's an after pilot you know what works what doesn't you would have got a uh, understanding of uh, the the state of your data uh, fabric where what data is coming there might be some curing and quite a few of them you can do it yourself you need not we would have demonstrated how to build maybe some models we would have uh, passed on to you and some of the other models you can build yourself so you can actually do phase two and phase three all by yourself or you can after phase two you have got most of the data integrated to do most of your predictive behavior analytics there are some models we would have demonstrated uh, which can create uh, some boot camps which you can use and do phase three yourself so but at each step, what we have seen is when we are doing the data pipeline and related work, uh, we do it in a in such a seamless manner. You know, we have uh, mostly converted uh, uh, people to move to phase three, which is uh, operationalizing. Now I'll I'll move to the next one where we are talking about you know which I'm I'm just uh, trying to reiterate that is you know first we do a pilot, then we scale uh, in in terms of we should be able to build the platform which can take care of whether it is a variety of data, volume of data, or you need it in high velocity, we would have ensured that uh, technologically and analytically all boxes are ticked. And operationalize is, is when your, your customers will really start seeing the uh, changes, but uh, in the pilot itself, they would have seen, and during scale itself, it is not scale, it's not a 14 week without any output, it is converted, each of the phases are converted into smaller sprints, and there will be something which you can take it to the customers as well. So what, what will it take? You know, what, what does it look in terms of uh, the architecture? So typically, you know, you have uh, the information which is in your silos, whether it's co-banking, you have payment system, you have credit card systems. These days you have digital, you have uh, web uh, systems or, uh, you know, or mobile or, or uh, things like uh, Adobe and whichever is uh, helping you, you know, Salesforce, uh, CRM, all of them. So we will start getting data from there where we do have a domain model of the data and it is about mapping those into this. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I talked to you about the partnerships which we have with an appropriate tool of choice. We move the data into a common store after cleaning and uh, once it is integrated and transformed, we create uh, analytical data sets, which goes through a process of uh, topic modeling, uh, you know, and uh, which uh, then thereafter emotional analytics, sentiment analytics, various aspects uh, which are uh, put, put to test. And uh, you do what we call as behavioral analytics, which leads to the moments that matter. That is uh, to identify that, you know, uh, we can help Sam in, in you know, Sam is requiring or, or uh, is, is on the contrary about his savings or to understand that Noel might be considering, you know, he's, he's a risk of parking. So we do that and that is supported by all the math stat models, whether it's correlation, grouping, you know, explanatory that, that anybody does and we do have a model factory. And most importantly to operationalize or digitize that we will provide uh, the integration into BI tools, which helps you ensure that you are able to view and understand what is happening within the system. When I'm talking about the system, I'm not talking about the computer systems, but uh, uh, the behavioral system, what is happening to which set of customers, how are they doing, going all the way, drilling all the way down to individual customers or a sample of customers. Uh, it can, the outcome of this, whether it is uh, the emotional state or or, uh, or uh, moments that matter or, you know, the persona, 
whichever way you look at it how best to integrate that can be made available over an api or over uh, uh, an engine to or, or over as a data dump to your banking applications or even this can form inputs to other analytical tools or models so with that i would uh, hand it back over to uh, peter to talk to uh, us uh, regarding how to what are the next steps and how we can really go on and build uh, uh, extract uh, customer high customer value by hyper personalization in banking using predictive behavior analytics over to you peter thank you very much morley so why a pilot why a proof of value well, firstly, because this is an extremely innovative technique. Um, secondly, because it applies to some of the channels where it's actually been very hard to get an understanding of what's driving the, the consumer behavior. For example, digital channels, we know that with digital, it's extremely hard to build rapport. And yet we also know that rapport is incredibly vital to the bank. So the pilot will explain what customers value and why they value it and the role that it takes in their decision making. It'll also show you where there are opportunities where you can immediately act before you even build out the rest of the system at a strategic level. So we can say, well, if our customers typically exact value this and we're not doing so well at meeting their expectation in that area, we need to address that. Or that these customers are feeling these kinds of emotional states, which are not helpful to either of us, perhaps we can influence that. So it shows where you, A, have capability already, B, where you have the data that you may need or where we may need to go and find it in order to build a larger system, but it also gives you immediate outputs. And why is that important? Well, no, it's no surprise to anybody that we've all been going through massive transformation as a result of the pandemic. Um, and as I said, there's been a big dash into digital and we're trying to understand what all of this transformation means and what it means to customers. What do things like branch closure or inaccessibility of personal banking mean to customers and is it important? We also know that when we try to use rational arguments or facts to win over somebody who's in a deeply emotional state, that isn't easy and it takes a long time. It's very hard to use facts to convince somebody out of an emotional state. You need to be able to be empathic about what they're emotional about and why. And when you do know that, it's possible that you can begin to predict what decision they're likely to take next and what you could do to head them off. But the end game of this is to be in a position where you can anticipate that before they've reached a critical decision point. So to use Noel's case, if we wait for Noel to become symptomatic, that is, he's displaying behavior that we associate with churn, it's probably too late already. So we want to focus on keeping Noel before he actually makes that decision. And you can only do that when you're looking at behavioral motivation and the triggers of behavior and not wait for the symptoms to appear. So the pilot gives you immediate strategic input as well as an assessment of how ready you are or what it will take for your organization to be able to do this for yourself. And that's why myself and um, the team at Exemplify and within um, Maverick have come together because we not only have the innovative strategy and the approach, we have the technology to implement that, but it's about giving you the wherewithal to do it for yourself. So in conclusion then, before we take a few questions, customer emotions can definitely be detected through language. And we know that those impact business decisions and that's in a quantifiable way. So we know that certain emotions and combinations of emotions lead to typically certain business outcomes. When we combine that with the data that you already hold, you get a much better predictive algorithm. You get a much better model that you can use to anticipate what somebody's going to do next before they do it. And after all, that's what most predictive models are designed to do. We're designed to find customers who are in a buying mode or we think that they're about to churn. It also feels much more human to customers because they begin to feel that you know them and not just about them. It doesn't take years and years and millions and millions of dollars to do this. You can get results very quickly. 
uh, within a three month time frame. And the payback, when we looked at some of the financials associated with this can be quite impressive. So it's a, something that we can do, which builds on what you've got, gives you a new insight, a new innovative approach that feels much more human in a world where empathy is becoming more and more important. And that ultimately leads to financial performance improvements on both the top line and the bottom line. We can increase revenues, we can reduce our costs, we can increase customer tenure and their lifetime value by not only increasing the tenure, but by stimulating them to be more economically active during that period. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Saloni as we take some questions. Thank you, Peter and Murli, for your valuable insights. This has been really informative. Uh, we got a perspective of why listening to the customer and understanding customer emotions is so important. Also on how behavioral analytics drives customer and business value and how it can be implemented. So we are now ready to move on to the questions submitted by our attendees. And I want to remind you all that you can still submit your questions through the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. So here we have our first question. The question is, the, the, question is, the outcome from emotions are ideally temporary. How can that provide accurate analysis? I'll, I'll take that one because that's such a good question. Um, and I spent years figuring out how to do this. So firstly, that's an absolutely true point. Most emotions are ephemeral, as opposed to things like beliefs and attitudes, which are slightly long lasting. However, what we can do is, there's two phases. The first is we, we um, research what is important to people. So what do they really care about? That's what stimulates emotions that are significant. Um, and the second thing is how you operationalize that. Well, the intervening stage is a scoring mechanism. And this is where it becomes imperative that you can run unique emotional signatures because every episode that a customer goes through, every interaction, every journey impacts the way that they feel about a bank or an organization. So if you have lots of very positive interactions that provide stimulus for positive emotions, that tends to make people feel more well disposed towards a bank. And if they're very negative and they continue to be negative, then of course that has the opposite effect. Now, whilst we might all start with a similar outcome. So for example, I respond to a marketing campaign, I open a product. We can make some assumptions about how people feel from that by doing some generalized research, by rescoring everybody on a frequent basis on what's happened to them and how they feel about that. We can look at the influence of individual episodes on the way that they feel and what may be expressed as attitude. So it isn't reliant on running a big regression model on saying, well, what are all of the things that have happened in the last year to this customer? And let's see if we can build some kind of predictive algorithm. It's actually more focused on the event stream. So what is happening to this customer in their life? What's influencing their behavior? and we adjust the score so everybody has their own unique emotional signature, which is being updated by all the episodes that they've been exposed to, that we as a bank know about, and therefore we can start to make some sense that they're on a journey of disappointment or they're on a journey of delight or they're you know, currently feeling great senses of anxiety. So yes, emotions come and go, but they build up over time. The other advantage of this approach is it deals with the non-sequential, non-linear reality of our lives. None of us are on a lifelong journey that's been pre-plotted. So we're going through and we're encountering things in an asynchronous way. They don't come sequentially. They come at, you know, I'll do step one, step two, and then I'll pause for a while, and then maybe I do step five before I come back to step three, and maybe I've forgotten step two, so I go back to do that. By using this approach, you can deal with that kind of ephemeral nature of human behavior and take each episode in its own unique value. And unless it's a super significant event, most of those aren't deciding binary points one way or the other. They're usually contributing to an outcome. So if you thought about that radar plot with emotions and they're moving around, we're tracking them as they're moving around. And it's rare that one of them will jump them straight to one point and jump straight back. 
Great, thank you, Peter. Our second question for today is, uh, what are the challenges to handle and process the valid set of data? Murli, would you like to take that? Yep, thanks, uh, Saloni. Uh, thanks uh, uh, for the question, uh, very, very important one. Like I said, you know, uh, to, to figure out emotions, we need to keenly listen. You know what? What uh, that's that's where you know that's where uh, most of uh, this uh, uh, analytics gets into challenge in terms of uh, we try to uh, relate too much uh, on on transactions while they are important their transactional behavior, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, customer is interacting at least uh, by a uh, uh, significant order of magnitude more in non-transactional ways. So too much of uh, focus on uh, transactional system and transactional data is a first uh, challenge which you have to overcome, uh, which would mean that you need to uh, keep uh, collecting all possible information, uh, especially these days, and it will even be more with uh, no, not many people coming into the branch and then uh, because of uh, added social distancing, which is uh, not only the lifestyle change, but it is also ma mandated. So one is to co collate all that information. This should help us actually, because you know most of the interactions are digital, not uh, necessarily physical. Uh, that is the first challenge. Second one is in most places, especially uh, earlier, if you would have taken the journey of computerization, most likely you have various versions of truth. So to get that all of it together, that's the second. But at the same time, Keeping a good balance of not trying to boil the ocean and, and uh, having, you know, uh, getting few of them accurate and correct and pick up those ones and, and prioritizing. And most importantly, you need, uh, you need partners who understand uh, all both aspects. That is one, which is uh, understanding uh, the behavioral analytics uh, very deeply. Second, one who understands the nuances of banking and what data is available, what data is not available, and how critical is it for the financial decision making. So these two things, and also uh, the the culture of uh, listening to the customer and uh, believing that it is possible to hyper personalize the service. So it is just not one specific thing which you get corrected and you are on your way. So it's just a combination of these. Great, thank you, Murli. We have time to take one more question, maybe. Uh, the question is, uh, from the business intelligence perspective, while we are targeting each customer and thinking micro, how can financial institutions leverage the behavioral analytics in formation of strategy, strategy and products at a macro level? I'll have a first go at that one, and I think Marilee can add to that. So. Um, yeah, there's a difference between the kind of strategic segmentation or the attribute segmentation that we use for customers, and that's often expressed as things like personae. So we will have a customer type X, and we've researched them, and we know what typically drives them and the kind of behavior. And most banks will have a range of different segments with ranges of different products that they associate with those. So we have already got used to the idea that different customers as groups are treated differently depending upon which segment we fit them into. Now, the thing about um, behavioral analytics and predictive behavioral analytics is that it lays in another layer of segmentation, which is an emotional segmentation. So to make that a real case, you might have customers like me and there's a segment like me and you've researched me and you have a lot of attributes associated with me. However, angry me is a completely different person from afraid me or happy me and if you treat all three versions of that the same all you're going to do is irritate all three versions of me so what we've identified is that within a strategic or attribute segmentation of the bank people will move in and out of emotional segmentation now some of those emotional states we know are directly linked to outcomes things that we can measure so we take the emotional state and link it to the behavioral state, um, the business state, and we can say, when we see this, it typically results in a customer buying another product, or it typically results in a customer closing their account or becoming financially inactive. And all of those are quantifiable. 
So the emotional state, the behavioral state, the motivations are drivers. And the drivers not only of customer satisfaction or empathy, but directly of business results of things that we can measure. The trick with doing all of this, and I'm going to hand back to Murali because he talks a lot with Maverick about how you represent that in BI, is how do you show the impact of things like the macro sense of trust and whether that's increasing or diminishing and why it's different from sentiment, which is an over aggregation of emotion and attitude. So Murali, just back to you, perhaps you can touch some more on that. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Uh, while I'll, I'll I'll borrow it from uh, other aspects when you are you know when you are aggregating and uh, disaggregating in in a manner. Here it is new because uh, uh, we haven't have uh, you know data to uh, figure out you know how business has affected. We haven't we haven't really tracked the time series of individual behavior or individual emotions, but considering their you know uh, going back to you know uh, the standard basis on which it is considered you know it, is, it has a distribution which is uh, specific and uh, the nuances can be figured out uh, most of your your causality uh, related models or uh, 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 way of viewing it will for for example i'm sure um, not only related to the economic reality but uh, uh, in in post covid you know, uh, many emotions have changed. You know, somebody was asking, how will we aggregate? This is one of the rare times. Typically, it might be normally distributed, but it is skewed. Almost everybody is anxious or fearful. But you can, you know, and, and that can be, I'm sure that can be scientifically assessed by uh, and understanding each of us behave and, and uh, collate them together in, in cluster mode in terms of, uh, Visually, you're you're looking at you know various uh, tools and uh, uh, methods, but you know it will be using the same set of tools, but looking at it over a period of time and trying to find clusters and uh, uh, places what this data also is telling you in an aggregated manner. Uh, what I would put in is you know is is an a rare noel is still okay. But if you are finding as an aggregate, you know, there are many people like Noel who might move to a competitor, then we need to, I will also address that question, which was earlier talked about, you know, how will it uh, address your product strategy? It is, it is completely different. So tools might be the same, even approach might be the same, but that will lead to many interesting possibilities. You know, when you are talking about real segment of one, is not only by analyzing the transactional data. If you really want to hyper uh, personalize, hyper personalizing it also means that it is not one product for Murli whenever he comes to the bank. It is depending on my last two, three interactions. Can I change? So to do that, you need to have uh, appropriate uh, uh, tools. Uh, or our appropriate use of the same set of tools, which might be, you know, which uh, are, are MathStat based or machine learn based, you know, because understanding an emotional state is not the end of everything. We need to still study further. Thank you, Murli, and thank you, Peter. Uh, due to time constraint, we haven't been able to respond to all the questions in the question panel. However, please be rest assured of our response, which would be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. So with this, we are at the close of the webinar. I would like to thank you all and appreciate your valuable time for our webinar today. We will be sharing the webinar recording to all the registrants and all the participants through a follow up email in the next 24 to 48 hours. Also, this webinar recording would be available in our website in the next four working days. Thank you once again. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.